Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Teresa Gillarducci. I'm the director of the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis at the New School. The um, center is um, within the Department of Economics um, at the New School. This is the annual Bernard Schwartz um, lecture, and I am the Bernard and Irene Schwartz Professor of Economic Policy Analysis, directing the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis. So I would like to say a few words about Bernard Schwartz. He is a, um, a progressive visionary who cares deeply about the direction of economic policy in this country and in New York. Um, he is a very successful industrialist and has donated um, his, um, his personal wealth and income to many, many organizations that advance that agenda, including the New School, and we're deeply grateful uh, for his generosity. Um, the center, as I said, is in, embedded within the economics department, and we have affiliate economists. We have over 28 economists at the New School, and we're, and we're dedicated um, to bringing the kind of economics that we do at the New School, um, which is historical, it pays attention to um, to power and to institutions and to, and to government rules and to uh, private sector markets, as well as economic theory. And we are dedicated to bring our perspective um, and, our, and our knowledge and vision um, to mainstream policy making. It is my pleasure to introduce the president of the New School, um, and he will, David Van Zandt, will introduce our speaker. I'm um, proud to say that our president is a new president. He was um, a, he started his job as the president of the New School on January 1st of this year. He, uh, David Van Zant, is the eighth president of the New School. He is a PhD sociologist. He's an attorney and a visionary in reforms in higher education. He has a record of distinguished academic publication and of leadership. Most recently, he comes to us from the deanship of the Northwestern um, School of Law. Um, that is one of the most top ranked, um, the most top ranked schools, law schools in the nation. He served as dean there from 1995 until 2010. Under his leadership there at Northwestern um, Law School, he transformed its approach to its admissions, um, to its curriculum, and to the school's engagement with the larger society and with the larger community. Through his continual analysis of the legal profession, which is how many folks um, are produced from law schools, what um, government agencies and the private sector need in the United States and abroad, and through the demands of the global uh, marketplace, he transformed um, that university. When he comes here to the new school, he does a similar analysis. What are we good at? What are we known for? Um, what does the world need? So in the, just the few months that he's been here, he has led the university um, to a, a broader um, reformulation of itself. Our university, he has defined and has noticed, is steeped in innovation. We're called the new school, even though we're an old school. Um, he um, has uh, recognized our strengths and, will, and, has, um, note, and has defined us as a school that will continue to play a major role in designing, managing, and sustaining a new economy, in architecture, in urban studies, in organizational change management, in psychology, media studies, and product design, just to name a few of the things that we do well. And never content with stasis, that's why we're called the new school, <laughs> um, the university with David at its helm has adapted its curriculum and is continuing to adapt the curriculum to embrace new areas of study that respond to this new economy. For example, we recently welcomed our first master's degree in um, environmental policy and sustainability. We've launched a master's programs in strategic design and management, in urban practice and design, and urban ecologies. Graduates of these programs will start off with tools not only to navigate this new economy, but to emerge as its, as its leaders. And one such graduate is the Honorable um, Tom DiNapoli. And um, David Van Zant will tell you more about him. I'm honored to welcome you, David, um, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Teresa. You're, you're a, a, a 
very valuable part of this community running the SEPA Center, and um, it, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be, able to, to be able to work with you since I've been here. My role tonight, though, is to welcome everyone uh, to the Irene and Bernard Schwartz Lecture, The Promise of Public Pensions, uh, with tonight's speaker, New York State Controller Thomas P. DiNapoli. Welcome, Tom. Um, <clears throat> this is sponsored, as Teresa said, by the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis, and as she mentioned a little bit about it, uh, I see its real role at this institution is, is really applying a lot of the great economic knowledge that's out there to very important public, public policy uh, problems. One of the things that uh, Teresa mentioned that the new school is about innovation, and I certainly agree with that. The new in our name should be about innovation, creativity, uh, being on the cutting edge. But the other part, the, the other sort of basic principle of the new school has always been public engagement. Um, being engaged with important public policy issues, looking for social change, trying to advance social justice um, throughout the com uh, community. And the Schwartz Center is just, um, uh, is just one, one part of our effort in, in, in that way. Well, why are we meeting here tonight? Um, the Great Recession's uh, impact effect has been a damaging effect uh, on municipal budgets has created a real urgent need for reform of state public pension systems. However, um, as we teeter on the edge of, of a double-dip recession, we also face a reality uh, of a baby boomer retirement bubble. While some detailed reforms might be necessary, now is not the time to make quick short-term decisions to cut pensions across the board for public workers. We face a problem for all workers, both private and public, in a very structural way in terms of how we're going to support our retirements going forward. I'm worried for myself. I'm also very much worried for my children in what will happen in what will happen in this area. So we have a great speaker for us tonight to talk about uh, talk about those issues. Um, Thomas DiNapoli, uh, as a sole trustee of the one hundred and forty six point nine billion dollar New York State pension fund, um, is going to discuss uh, the possibilities that we have and what we can do and in, in, in what we need to do. He will describe the health and affordability of the New York State Pension Fund, analyze its potential economic and human costs of, of the leading uh, pension reform proposals, and consider some of the wider implications of the ongoing erosion of retirement security in both the public and private sector. Um, Controller DiNapoli took office in February 2007 and was elected for a full term, a full, full four-year term in November 2010. He is New York's chief fiscal officer responsible for auditing the operations of all state agencies and local governments, managing the state pension fund, overseeing the New York state uh, and local retirement system, reviewing state and New York City budgets, approving state contracts, and administering the state's payroll and central accounting system. As the sole trustee of the uh, almost $150 billion state pension fund, which is one of the largest institutional investors in the world, uh, he has imposed tough rules to prevent improper influence on investment decisions. He's invested millions of dollars in New York companies to grow the state economy. He has identified more than $1.5 billion in savings and revenue enhancements for state and local governments through his wider job. He's giving pub the public unprecedented access to financial data on the government revenues and expenditures. You can go right on the web and, and pick it up. Um, he's, proposing, he's proposing reforms to make the state budget process more responsible and open. He's also instituted an ambitious green initiative to promote cost-effective, environmentally sustainable practices. And he's improved the state contracting process to encourage uh, competition and equal opportunity. Prior to becoming the comptroller, he represented Northwestern Nassau County in the State Assembly for 20 years and worked in the telecommunications industry. He's also served as an adjunct professor. He holds a bachelor's degree in history from Hofstra, but far more important is he holds, he holds a master's degree in management and urban policy from our Milano School. Um, I had the great pleasure of meeting Tom uh, earlier this year at an association of, uh, for the better, uh, Betterment of New York uh, meeting, and at the, at the time I, I knew he was one of our alums, and I went up to him and I said, Tom, we'd really love you to come to the new school and, and talk to us, and he agreed on the spot. You know, and, and, and he also followed up, which sometimes for politicians is not the, uh, <laughs> but I really appreciate your taking the time to be with us tonight and, and, and welcome. So, oh, one thing I should mention, we have a glass of water down here for Tom. This is not rosé. This is, this is water, fruit water, so okay. All right, please join us, Tom. Thanks.
I will toast our new president. <laughs> and let's see if it's really uh, non-alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, President Van Zandt, for that uh, very kind and generous introduction. Thanks to everyone who took time uh, to join us this evening. Uh, I'm, I'm very privileged and honored to be here um, for a number of reasons. Let me just mention two. First of all, I am a very proud graduate of, of the New School. And uh, I had a great experience here. And I remember uh, I started classes when I um, was working for uh, AT&T. Some of you are old enough to remember the old days when we had Ma Bell and one phone company and, you know, ancient history, right? And as part of bettering my uh, career interests, uh, I en enrolled in um, what was then called the Graduate School for Management and Urban Professions, as I recall, with an unfortunate acronym of GIZMUMP. <laughs> so when you said I'm a GIZMUMP student, it was like, took a lot of explaining. But I also remember as I was getting into the program and knew that uh, I had made the right choice to come to the new school, I remember one day I was uh, uh, leaving work to come to class. And uh, one of the managers, several steps higher than I was, met me in the elevator and said, oh, where are you heading off to? And I said, well, I'm, I'm in a master's program and I'm going off, to, going off to classes tonight. And I'll never forget, he, he, he looked at me and said, oh, what school are you attending? And I said, the new school. And he looked at me, straight face, in a very corporate way, and said, oh, which new school? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, it's the new school for social research, that school. So the branding, I know, has always been an issue, right? <laughs> but it's never been uh, an issue with me in terms of uh, this being an extraordinary uh, place of learning. And I know for me, uh, professionally, although I, I uh, you know, was planning a corporate career, uh, it was a, it took a human uh, resources management specialization with a certification in labor relations. One of my first courses was actually on employee benefit plans, right? So I remember when um, I ran for uh, the state assembly, I actually needed, I think, one or two more courses to get the, the degree finished. And, you know, some of my friends said, what are you even bothering for? You're not in the corporate world anymore. I said, no, I, I'm this close. I got I to get that master's. And here, years later, it made sense. It was always great knowledge for me, and certainly having the opportunity now to serve as uh, state control, I really do draw on what I learned here. And one of my best friends that I met through those years and that experience, uh, Georgette Guestley, who you should also have come speak here, is, is the director for Deferred Comp for New York City. And actually, she started the Deferred Comp program for the city, and she's doing a great job, and she also is uh, an expert on that area of um, of economic security as well. So remember Georgette, and you can blame me for the invitation for her to come, for her to come speak. I'm also uh, privileged to be here, not only because of my personal connection to this, to this school, uh, but in our controller's office, we have a family connection to this school. And Kathy McCormick joins us, and uh, the McCormick family has a very soft feeling about the new school. Uh, Kathy's uh, son, Chris, unfortunately, we lost earlier this year, and uh, certainly the outpouring of support from faculty and staff and, and from the president uh, to the McCormick family has meant a lot to all of us. And uh, I know Christy had a great experience here, and I had the chance to hear that from him. And we used to trade new school stories, right, when, uh, when we would talk. So I dedicate, uh, Kathy, I dedicate uh, the lecture tonight to Christy's memory, knowing that, like me, he had a great time here at the new school, and it meant a lot to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I certainly uh, want to commend the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis for doing such important work on retirement security. And certainly in particular, I want to applaud the critical work of Teresa Gilarducci. Uh, as some in the media have labeled you, the most dangerous woman in America. I can't believe anybody would ever say that. So I say it lovingly, <laughs> given, given the great regard I have for your work. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity uh, to add my perspective on the future of retirement and on public pension funds, an issue that continues to provoke impassioned discussion and debate in state capitals, union halls, corporate boardrooms, and living rooms across this country. I don't have to tell you, 
from coast to coast, we are experiencing coordinated, sustained attacks on public employee pensions. If you only read the news accounts and editorials, you would come to the conclusion that all defined benefit public pensions are costly, unsustainable giveaways that are bankrupting states and localities. Anti-pension advocates have skillfully commandeered the debate and co-opted the media to such a degree that many in the public now accept this faulty premise. As trustee of the third largest state pension fund in America, I find those broad stroke mischaracterizations to be inaccurate and harmful to what should be a thoughtful debate. The truth is, some state and local plans have become significantly underfunded in recent years. Often, this has been caused by the short-sighted past practices of their sponsoring governments. But the fact remains, most state pension plans are sustainable for the long term. And that's certainly the case with the New York State and local retirement system. And I'm proud to report that as we mark our 90th year, the New York State Common Retirement Fund is among the best funded and best run in America. With a healthy annual return of 14.6% for our fiscal year of 2010-11 that ended on March 31st, the fund now has fiscal year audited assets totaling $146.5 billion, the highest since the global meltdown of 08-09. And despite the market's recent volatility, the fund remains well positioned for the future. Like all investors, our fund is forced to confront extraordinary market volatility and the tepid reco recovery from the Great Recession. But we remain strong and more than ready to meet our current and future obligations to retirees. The fact is, from the Great Depression to the Great Recession, the New York State Common Retirement Fund has successfully weathered every economic storm it has faced over the last nine decades. I believe the strength and endurance of our fund and other well-funded state plans serve as powerful counterweights to the relentless and misleading argument that public pensions are unsustainable. A number of key institutional factors have buoyed our retirement system since its establishment. Each year we set contribution rates for state and local government employers. And decade after decade, we have required state and local governments to make their payments to the fund. Unlike some states that have skipped their annual payments, sometimes for years, New York State has never missed a payment. Second, our conservative actuarial method continues to ensure that we will always be well-funded. Importantly, we follow this method scrupulously rather than take shortcuts in difficult times. Third, our investment expertise enables us to take advantage of market opportunities while our diversified and balanced portfolio allows us to minimize risk. Fourth, ethics, transparency, and accountability are crucial to the strength of any organization. We're no exception. Tonight I can report to you that the Office of New York State Controller is more ethical, transparent, and accountable than ever before in its history. When I became controller in 2007, I inherited a mess. My predecessor is currently serving a prison sentence for corruption in connection with mismanagement of the pension fund. From my first day in office, I made it my top priority to restore ethics and integrity to the pension fund's management. Over the past few years, we've instituted substantive changes that have strengthened the fund, putting more eyes and more scrutiny on the investment transactions we make. These reforms include banning the involvement of placement agents, paid intermediaries, and lobbyists in any investment transaction, and putting an end to pay-to-play campaign contributions, reporting investment performance results quarterly, and releasing all fund transactions to the public every month, and creating the positions of Inspector General and Special Counsel for Ethics, and assembling a pension integrity unit to identify and prevent pension errors, fraud, and abuse. These key reforms and others have transformed our office into a better, more accountable organization, one up to the task of protecting and sustaining the retirement benefits of the one million members of our system for the long term. A recurring theme in the attacks on public pension systems is that they're unaffordable. Here in New York, like other states, we hear again and again about how rising pension bills 
are eating up state and local budgets. There's no question that contribution rates are rising and placing pressure on state and local budgets. But we need to put this in perspective. According to the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College, pension contributions from state employers amount to 3.8% of state and local spending on average. Here in New York, the number is 2.4% of state operating funds. And while it is true that many local governments are experiencing significantly larger increases in the proportion of pension spending in their budgets, that is due largely to the rate increases that have come about after the near catastrophic collapse of the financial markets. The Wall Street meltdown of 2008 and 2009 hurt all investors, and pension funds were no exception. This led to the largest loss in our fund's history. Back in 2000, the year 2000, at a time when investment returns were exceptionally high and contribution rates were historically low, benefits were increased in New York State with an expectation that the market would stay strong forever. That's not what happened. Now we're at the other extreme, a time of fiscal stress, slow recovery from the global financial crisis, and spiking contribution rates, again caused largely by the market collapse of 08 and 09. I would point out that it's never wise to make policy at the extremes. I believe it would be a mistake to overreact and further undermine state retirement systems that have served us so well for so long. I would also point out that strong pension funds like ours are cost effective in that the vast majority of benefits are paid from investments. Over the past 20 years, including the meltdown year of 08 and 09, 83 cents of every dollar in benefits paid to New York retirees have come from investment returns, not employee or employer contributions. That's significantly higher than the national average of 68% or 68 cents out of every dollar for state plans. Another well-worn line of recent attacks on public pension funds, an argument that particularly disturbs me, is that they are bloated with retirees making six-figure pensions. In New York State, the facts tell a different story. In fiscal year 2010-11, the New York State Retirement Fund paid out $8.5 billion in benefits to 385,000 retirees and beneficiaries. Less than one-half of 1%, one less than one-half of 1% one of those retirees received pensions exceeding $100,000. The average annual New York State pension, excluding police and fire, which is higher, is $19,151, $19,151. 76% of our retirees receive less than $30,000 a year. One in five New York retirees in our system, nearly 70,000 individuals, receive less than $5,000 a year in a pension benefit. Even with the continued strength of our fund and other state funds, efforts to reform or restructure state pension funds continue across the country. Pick up the paper or scan the web almost any morning and you'll stumble upon yet another proposal in another state or locality to increase public employee pension contributions and raise the retirement age and service requir requirements. The most recent examples are the dramatic pension overhauls enacted in Rhode Island and uh, proposed in Kansas, and the fierce debate currently going on in California regarding Governor Brown's sweeping pension reform proposal, which among other things would raise the retirement age from 55 to 67 and require all public workers to contribute at least half the cost of the pensions. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, 39 states have made significant revisions to their pension plans in the past 18 months. And that includes New York State. Despite having one of the best funded state retirement systems in the nation, in 2009, the state legislature and governor passed a new pension reform called Tier 5 to make our system even more affordable and sustainable. Tier 5 increased employee contributions, capped the amount of overtime included in the calculation of pensions, increased the penalty for early retirement, and doubled the time required for vesting. And discussions about further pension reform continue in Albany, most revolving around what I would consider to be 
acceptable levels for debate, like the level of pension contribution and controlling overtime abuse. But there are some who continue to promote a more extreme change, moving away from defined benefit pensions, where the benefits are guaranteed, to defined contribution or 401k style savings accounts. From my point of view, this is unacceptable. The reality is that 401ks were never intended to take the place of pensions. They were designed to be savings vehicles to supplement pensions and social security income. And overall, in their relatively short history, they have proven to be woefully inadequate for those who rely on them for their primary retirement income. The financial crisis of 0809 dramatically demonstrated how a collapse in equity prices can decimate 401k retirement savings. According to Boston College's Center for Retirement Research, 401k plans lost a collective $1 trillion during the Great Recession. $1 trillion of retirement security gone. We've all heard the desperate stories of the past three years, retirees, some 75, 80 years old, many frail with health problems, who lost their savings when their 401k accounts nosedived and they were forced to find minimum wage jobs just to pay the rent and buy groceries. Countless others have been planning to retire, but now will have to continue to work indefinitely to survive economically. The recent market volatility is yet another reminder of the inherent instability of 401ks and how daunting it can be for individuals with 401ks to navigate their way to a secure retirement. It's that, if that's not enough of a reason to be wary of moving from pensions to 401ks, according to the National Institute on Retirement Security, defined benefit plans cost 46% less than individual 401k style savings accounts for several reasons. First, individuals investing their own 401k pay significantly higher fees and earn significantly lower rates of return. Also, individuals must base their asset allocation on their age and whether they are nearing or in retirement, while a defined benefit plan bases its allocation on market conditions. And finally, individuals must save at a rate that ensures that their funds will last well into their 90s. We all think we're going to live into our 90s these days, right? In contrast, large institutional plans like ours have assets based on the average mortality of our members. For those not moved by the human impact of moving from a defined benefit plan to 401k savings accounts, the facts tell us that doing this would be bad for our economy as well. Our economy is driven largely by consumer spending, and there is no doubt that the money spent by retirees collecting pensions and workers who have confidence they will receive a pension in the future has a stabilizing impact on the economy. In part because they receive secure state pensions, 77% of New York retirees continue to live in New York State, and the retirement benefits we pay out to them continue to be recycled into our state's economy, constituting an estimated $6.5 billion in spending, $9.5 billion in economic activity, and $1.3 billion in property taxes paid. We can extrapolate the New York experience across the nation. As the Executive Director of the National Institute on Retirement Security, Diane Oakley, said in her July testimony before the Senate Health Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, and I'm quoting her here, pensions are a high five for the U.S. economy. Investing $5.35 trillion in assets for the future, keeping some 5 million retired Americans out of poverty, supporting 5.3 million American jobs, and delivering retirement income at nearly 50% lower cost than individual defined contribution retirement accounts. NIRS also estimates that every taxpayer dollar invested in state and local pensions supports $11.45 in total economic activity, while each dollar paid out in benefits supported $2.36 in economic activity. The converse is also true. According to NIRS, without defined benefit pensions, spending on public assistance for the elderly would be about 40% higher. The bottom line is we need to fix what's wrong with pensions, but we shouldn't scrap them in favor of 401ks, something I believe will not work. It would undermine retirement security for even more Americans and would add even more uncertainty 
to our economy. For all the focus on the current cost of public pensions, the erosion of basic retirement security for working Americans has the potential to be a far more significant long-term problem for our nation. When the members of the greatest generation, like my parents, were raising their families, many enjoyed good-paying jobs that offered defined benefit pension plans. They worked hard to maintain a modest middle-class lifestyle that would remain available to them in retirement. If you grew up in a household with parents who were covered by a pension, you learned just how important it was to them in their old age. That kind of retirement security is becoming a thing of the past for too many in America. The number of private sector employees in large and mid-sized businesses who have a defined pension benefit has declined from 84% in 1980 to 30% in 2010. Company after company is dropping defined benefit plans. Just last week, McGraw-Hill announced that it is freezing its DB plan as of April of next year and replacing it with so-called market competitive offerings. I'm not sure what that means, but I suspect it's not terrific for the employees. As a result of this erosion in pensions, a rapidly growing number of Americans are at risk of retiring with a substantially lower standard of living or not retiring at all. Not surprisingly, most Americans are stressed out about retirement. In its recent report about pensions and retirement security, NIRS found that 84% of Americans are concerned about their ability to achieve a secure retirement. They are right to be concerned. This year, the first of 79 million baby boomers turned 65, and the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College reports that up to 45% of them, about 34 million men and women, are at risk of not being able to maintain their living standards in retirement. We know why, it's easy math. Eroding pensions, average Social Security benefits of $14,000 a year, and average 401k savings accounts of about $46,000. Over the next decade, things could get much worse as people living longer and longer will need considerably more retirement savings to live on. A recent study found that the number of Americans living past 90 will grow from 1.9 million today to more than 9 million by 2050. We need to recognize that the erosion of retirement security will only get worse. People are having a hard time making ends meet now, the result of the growing income equality that has taken place over the last 30 years, combined with our current economic troubles. Now fast forward 20, 30, 40 years from now, when today's underemployed become tomorrow's under-retired. We can't afford an impoverished generation of retirees. We do well here to remember our history. Back in 1918, a transformative New York leader, Governor Al Smith, signed a law that established a state commission on pensions to look into the creation of a pension fund for state and municipal workers. In 1920, as directed, the commission issued their report on, in their words, quote, the problem of retirement, unquote. The problem they were referring to was dire. In 1920 in New York, more than half of public employees didn't get a nickel in retirement. Far too many fell into desperate poverty. The commission recommended a pension plan for all public employees to ensure that retirees would not be poor in old age. And in 1920, legislating, legislation creating the New York State retirement system was passed, taking effect in 1921. Sadly, 90 years later, millions of New Yorkers and Americans across the nation are facing a new and growing problem of retirement that is undermining individual security and this nation's economic stability. We can't afford to walk away from this problem or leave it for someone else to deal with. In his speech in Kansas last week, President Obama gave voice to the urgency of advancing national policy to preserve the middle class the backbone of American society. He was right in his emphasis. We must include retirement security as an earned right for middle class Americans. Now is the time for a national commission to address the, the decline of retirement security. And tonight I'd like to spell out what I believe should be the agenda for such a commission. First, we must do no harm. 
The Commission must develop strategies to assure the continued viability of solid, well-funded, defined benefit public pension plans and identify strategies to restore the finances of plans that have fallen into disrepair. Both in the ways government sponsors design and fund plans, it is critical to adhere to best practices. Guidance or mandates may be needed to come via federal action. On the investment side, there is much work to be done to ensure that pension fund trustees fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities. Best practices and federal law can help ensure that trustees pay careful attention to review of asset allocation, recoveries from litigation, and proper attention to the use of consultants and payment of commissions and fees. And required training for fiduciaries can ensure that they understand their responsibilities and are current with best practices. On the administration side, so many plans have faltered because the, the sponsoring government failed to pay annual required contributions. Do we need to compel, by law, the payment of these contributions? Do we need standards to ensure scrupulous adherence to actuarial standards? Do we need active federal involvement to ensure that systems adopt and maintain aggressive standards to identify and prevent errors, fraud, and abuse? Second, the Commission must focus on the longer-term problem of the erosion of retirement security. And it must start its work from the simple premise that we need to ensure that people are able to support themselves when they're no longer able to work. We need to put a retirement system in place that allows the middle class to retire, and to retire in dignity and forestalls the profound future costs on government and individual taxpayers of providing food, housing, and other support to millions of Americans living well into their 90s who simply don't have enough to support themselves. We need a more appropriate focus for this discussion. We must change the perception of pensions being viewed primarily as a liability and a cost to taxpayers to what they really are, a pre-funding of a legitimate looming government liability and societal obligation. If people can't support themselves in retirement and in old age, taxpayers will foot 100% of these future costs. So from a fiscal standpoint, the responsible thing to do is to pre-fund these costs now. The commission that I'm calling for will need to explore ways to reverse the decline in the number and percentage of private sector workers covered by pensions. We should also find ways to offer cost-effective defined benefit plans to small employers and their workforces who increasingly account for most of the employment in this country. The commission should also evaluate whether we should amend federal laws to encourage consortiums of smaller pension plans with the goal of achieving the economies of scale in benefits and in investments. With a growing number of individuals who have no access to a pension, the Commission will need to review proposals that boost savings when a worker is young to avoid retirement poverty. The Commission also needs to assess the various proposals concerning whether to allow public plans to be opened to private individuals and employers and groups of employers. The Commission's membership should draw from representatives from labor, business, government employers, the fiduciary community, accountants and actuaries, and academia, which, like the Schwartz Center, has produced some of the most important work in this area. Many solid recommendations have been developed by the people in this room. And again, I salute the work of your center's Guaranteeing Retirement Income Project. Your ideas need to be part of the discussion. And as we tackle this issue, let's remember something. Much of what we're confronting today is the continued fallout from the market losses of 08 and 09. While there was a policy decision made to pump trillions of dollars into the financial system and the banks to shore that system up, there was not a policy decision made to shore up and rescue pension plans in the same way. If that had happened, we might not be having this discussion tonight. With the gridlock in Washington and the lack of resources, this type of federal intervention for pensions today obviously is unlikely. However, at the very least, instead of joining the race to the bottom to, to dismantle pension systems, this is the time to preserve pension plans that are proven to work, help those that need fixing, and tackle the larger question of what can be done for those not covered by pensions. This must be a national discussion and a national priority. Americans' retirement security is eroding by the day. 
solutions will need years to take hold. Failure to act now will take and make the problems worse for future retirees and will leave the full financial burden to future taxpayers. Some will argue that we can't afford to deal with this challenge in the way that I've outlined. I would argue that we can't afford not to. Working together, business, labor, and government can take steps to solve the problem of pension and retirement security. To me, the issue is simple. Guaranteed retirement benefits from well-run plans like New York State's have effectively provided economic security to Americans over many decades. Ensuring the strength of existing plans like ours and providing a path to a good pension to more Americans is the right choice for our citizens and the smartest, most responsible economic choice we can make. No doubt, even with the recent strong performance of our fund and others, near-term increases in pension contributions for employers will continue to fuel calls for dramatic changes to pension systems across the country. So will the recent volatility in the stock market. But it's wrong to use the bad behavior on Wall Street that nearly drove the world economy into another Great Depression as an excuse to rob millions of middle-class Americans of the safe and secure retirement they've earned. The answer to this crisis cannot be having people work until they're 82. But if we fail to take action, that will be the solution by default. We need to reclaim the high ground. Instead of doing away with pensions and replacing them with 401ks, we must refocus the agenda on fixing and improving access to pensions. The simple fact is, without a long-term public policy strategy on pensions, we risk condemning an increasing percentage of future generations of hardworking Americans to poverty in their senior years. We can't allow that to happen. For our people, for our economy, and for America's future, we must ensure retirement security. And all of us must take part in this debate. And I thank you for allowing me to offer my thoughts on that debate this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Comptroller. First of all, I, I, someone mentioned to me that we've actually had a visit from one of your predecessors, um, former uh, State Comptroller um, Ned Regans in ah. the room. I don't know where he where is. is. He? Where is he? There you are. Ah. Welcome. Give him Welcome. a round of applause. And I hope you will be willing to take some questions. Yes. So, yeah. so. Hey, not from Ned, because he's smarter than me on this no, right, stuff, so right. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> it's good to see you, Ned. Thanks for coming by. I start right here in the... Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Given that um, special risk pensions that were once reserved for firemen and police officers and how that is now being expanded to other um, categories, I think there was a, a article in the New York uh, USA Today the other day about this, that people who, they, in one state, if they have daily contact with prisoners, then they get special risk uh, pensions where they can retire earlier with increased benefits, things of this nature. And their daily contact was, is that the inmates would come to their office complex and clean the grounds. And that was their daily uh, contact. Um, these are going to become uh, increasingly uh, funded uh, liabilities for the different states. Do you have numbers on that? And do you, can you quantify as far as what you see the risks of that as far as for the states and what states you see as the most uh, are, in, are at, at risk? And also perhaps New York. To, to separate out the, the question of, those, of the enhancements? Yeah, I, you know, in New York, in the years where where the fund um, had much lower rates, you know, there were some enhancements in a variety of categories. You know, New York has, uh, we have thousands of employers and hundreds of different plans, uh, some of which are done by statute. Um, but certainly in recent years, there, there's, I can't think off the top of my head of any uh, change in terms of adding in categories, uh, you know, to police and fire. Um, and I certainly think in this climate right now, uh, you know, the, the debate and the discussion is on the other end, you know, uh, uh, discussions like the Tier 5 or the proposed Tier 6 rather than adding more people into, uh, you know, different pensions. I mean, even for police and fire, there was a change for, for ones that have been non-contributory to be contributory. So, you know, so I think right now the, the trend is in a different direction. You know, for other states, I don't have... Uh, 
in inventory on the changes that have happened there. My guess is, uh, and again, I think the media tends to pick on, you know, uh, examples that, that prove a point on one end of the spectrum, but I, I think I would be surprised to learn if most states are moving in terms of adding people in, into those pension categories. So, um, yeah, I, just, I don't think that's been the trend in New York. I don't think it's been the trend in most states. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Uh, are the uh, state and local pension funds invested in the natural gas industry? And if they are, at what figure would that be? Uh, the gas industry, is, as we all know, has been overstated by their reserves by as much as 80 percent by the New York, as reported by the New York Times. You know, when you have um, 140 billion dollars, you're kind of invested everywhere. <laughs> Uh, most of our investments, you can imagine with our size, are uh, in, in um, public equities and index funds. So uh, energy sector is certainly a part of, of index funds, and I suspect anybody in this room that has a mutual fund, you're in an energy sector as well, uh, and some of those include uh, those that are involved with, uh, with gas. I suspect there's another part to your question. Right, right. So. Is the issue related to fracking by chance? I, I tell you, this master's from the new school. It has made me so darn smart. So let's get to that part of the question, which I think is, is the more important part. And if I preempted someone else on that, I apologize. Um, you know, again, because we're, because we're in index funds, we, we are exposed to a whole range of, of corporations in a whole series of sectors. And when we identify sectors where there are emerging issues that cause concern, we try to be responsible investors. So the issue for us always is one of risk identification and risk mitigation. And again, we're a pension fund and we're a fiduciary, so our concern is the return to the fund. And, and a corporation that in, is involved in, in an area of risk that ultimately could affect the bottom line is a concern to us. So risk could be of many levels. It could be in a governance structure. It could be in, in a financial you know, structure. It, it could certainly be in being involved with activities that result in harm to a community, that result in lawsuits and regulatory uh, costs. So following, as everybody's been following this debate on hydraulic fracturing, we have been engaging the companies that we're involved in, and we do this in concert with our brother and sister pension funds as well, in raising the question through engagement, which could take the form of, of a written request, a letter, uh, or uh, uh, a shareholder resolution, particularly in cases where we have an energy company that's not being responsive to our, to our engagement, where we ask for an identification of the risk. We have been pressing for because of the concerns about the environmental impact for a more clear discussion, well by well, of what activities the companies are involved in, for an identification of uh, the kind of additives that may be uh, a part of the fluids that are used as part of this practice, for an assessment of um, how they can move to uh, any kind of additive that re would reduce the risk or the potential for polluting public supply uh, water wells or drinking water supplies, surface or groundwater supplies. In some cases, we've gotten companies to agree to the requests that we've made. In others, we've had resistance and we have, we have promoted resolutions, uh, not all of which pass, but which have certainly focused attention and call for more responsibility in this industry. This year, as part of our agenda, we're also asking for the companies to address the issue of community opposition meaning that if, if you're putting a heavy investment on this technology, but you're operating in an area where the local community by ordinance or local law has prohibited the practice, why are you doing that? What, what does that do in terms of the viability of this as, as uh, an economic impact that makes sense? W what is the anticipation of, of the regulatory framework that will be in place? What will that would the, be the impact of that on, on the bottom line as well? 
what has been the track record in terms of fines and, and, and uh, relating, relating to environmental damage largely and for disclosure of that information. So, you know, we make money by being invested and we want to continue to be invested in companies that are making money. But we want to be invested in companies that are responsible and responsive to the concerns that are out there. So we're going to continue to be uh, as proactive as we have been to ensure that these risk issues are being addressed by companies in, in the natural gas and, and, and oil industry. Separate from that, our office, among our many different responsibilities, is we are in charge of administering, along with the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Attorney General's Office, the, uh, the oil spill fund in New York State. What we found in our analysis of, of, of New York's uh, regulatory framework is that there is not a similar compensation fund for, uh, for problems, environmental problems or, or, or uh, degradation that happens from gas drilling. There's gas drilling going on now. Fracking is, is the new technology and the new issue, but there, there, there are gas wells in New York State right now. And now if you have a problem, your only remedy uh, if you're harmed is a private right of action which is different than what we do for oil spills. So we have proposed as part of the debate that's going on in New York, and again, because we administer the oil spill fund, to do something similar. I don't know if New York is going to go down the road of, 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 of approving fracking. That's, that's obviously done by the Department of Environmental Conservation, not by our office. But if they are going to move in that direction, we need to put protections in place. So if there is an accident or there is a harm, there is a clear fund that's set up through industry fees that is going to be there to deal with any of the problems that are there. And even if we don't go to fracking, there are communities now where there are gas wells and we don't have that kind of protection for them. So uh, you know, on the government side, our role is somewhat limited, uh, but in terms of our, our wanting to have a parallel program to the oil spill fund, we've proposed that. We propose it as legislation. It's been introduced in at least one house of the legislature. Hopefully next year we'll get both houses to look at it. I know it's being talked about as part of the regulatory discussions that are going on right now with fracking. Uh, and uh, in terms of the investment role, we, we've probably been one of the most proactive states in terms of pressing this issue in a responsible way with those companies we invested. Let's take uh, one from over on this side right here. Get a mic. Thank you, Controller DiNapoli. I'm wondering if you could say a little more about this proposal you have of the National Commission on the Future of Retirement uh, uh, Savings, and uh, if you know where you might be planning to take this, and who you maybe are thinking to talk with about this to try to move this idea along. Well, I'm hoping that the wide coverage that tonight's lecture will get <laughs> will result in the president hearing about it. Because I think it should be a presidential commission. I mean, I think, I think the issue, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of stuck in the state by state trench warfare on, you know, like in New York, whether I have a new tier. And uh, you know, it really, we need to elevate the whole discussion. I really think it should be a presidential commission. And I think, I think the membership should be drawn from a, from a wide variety of stakeholders and certainly uh, different regions of the country as well. Um, you know, if, if, if we can't get national leadership to convene it, then, you know, perhaps, you know, discussions with, um, you know, with uh, my colleague treasurers and controllers would, would be a place for us perhaps to come together. There are national associations that could sponsor us. But I really think that, especially going into a very important presidential year, we, we need, we need the, the elected national leadership to say, you know what, you know, th there are many big issues, and we talk a lot about Medicare, and we talk a lot about Social Security, but this is another piece of it. And, and, and I really think, you know, from the highest level, uh, that's where it needs to be convened. So to the extent that I could get some attention to it, and that's why I was really pleased, you know, when the president, this president, asked me to, uh, I always love it a president asked me to do anything, uh, but, you know, asked me to give this, uh, this talk this evening, because I, you know, I had mentioned the idea of a national commission at the Council of Institutional Investors, and just mentioning a national commission, we got a lot of attention. So we put some flesh on the bones tonight, and I'm hoping this will advance the discussion a little further. And maybe Teresa's going to help us, too, get the word out there. But I really think, I, I think it needs to be, it needs, I would prefer to see a pres presidential commission, something that could be done quickly. If, you know, some, somebody said, Tom, why don't you ask, you know, for Congress to, you know, enact a law to establish it. I think by the time Congress would get to it, we, you know, I'll be, 
I'll be 82, it's still working. But, uh, you know, so I think presidential would be, the, would be my preference. But if not, you know, I don't think we should wait too long, and I, I think we should figure out how like-minded people could come together and, and convene such a commission. What, do you have one right, right over there by the pole? Um, thank you, thank you for your comments. Um, I thought they were they were very useful. Um, so I I have a question related to some of the discussion points you laid out for the national commission, which is they, they make a lot of sense to me, and I think it makes sense to address them nationally. But given the the political realities of the United States, would it not make sense to do that in a New York level too? I mean, opening the public sector pension plant infrastructure to private sector workers is something that you know, people here have worked on. Is that something yeah. that you would drive forward? Yes, yeah. No, I think it's a good point. I mean, uh, you know, I, I do think we need to, you know, to really change the whole discussion. And, and uh, you know, I do worry somewhat if we, if we just talk only in the context of our own state. And frankly, in New York, we, we can talk from a position of strength, you know, as opposed to some of the other states where it's real crisis, because they didn't pay their pension obligations when times were good, you know, so they come into a bad time, and the market loss, and they, they're, they're really caught short, and they have cash flow problems. They can't even meet their current obligations. We don't have that in New York. But, but I, you know, so I, I still would prefer to see a, a broader discussion, because I think that's what's required. I don't think we should wait to, to look at some of the other pieces, but some of it may require changes in federal law, in tax law, you know, in IRS regulations and so on. So, you know, I don't think we can escape, you know, the fact that this needs to be, you know, addressed beyond New York State. You know, and working with Teresa and others in academia, we, you know, we can work through some of those issues. But, I, I, you know, it's not quite so simple to say we're going to pass a New York law and let anybody in the system, you know, because we have certain tax advantages, you know, that we could be jeopardized. You know, there's, there's a reason why this plan is, you know, set up the way it is. So I, I don't see how we can avoid the federal connection. So it would seem to me if we have a larger discussion, uh, it would be more appropriate to us, you know, some states may not choose to move in that direction. They may not be in a strong enough position to, you know, to do it. But I do think we're going to need, you know, guidance and approval at the national level for us to even move on our own. So you, you can't avoid it. But but if, if we can't get a national discussion, we should certainly, you know, pursue it. Um, and Teresa was filling me in on, you know, some of the California proposals. Uh, you know, so other states are starting to look, you know, look at this direction. But we can't avoid Washington on some of this. Thank you. Thank you for a, a very interesting discussion. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and turn to the investing side of the fund. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to what return target you operate under. And then you mentioned in your uh, comments um, uh, investment opportunities. And I'm curious about what you might see out there as an opportunity. And then here I'm thinking along the lines of Governor Cuomo's recent comments about public plans, investing, and in infrastructure. Thank mm -hmm. you. You know, the real challenge lately has been the volatility in, in, in the marketplace. And, uh, and I, I appreciate So you know better than me. <laughs> but my hair, keeps, my hair keeps falling out. Yours is still there. So you're doing better than me. And, and, it, and it is very volatile. You know, in, in the introduction, you mentioned 146.9, which I appreciated. That was our first quarter yeah, results. <laughs> The last quarter wasn't quite so good, but we're back up again, you know, because it's been up. Of course, today was a down day. You didn't bring me luck today. Uh, but, 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 we're, we're, but we're, you know, we've been back up. I use the 146.5 because that's our March 31st number. That's our audited number. And, you know, my friends kid me sometimes when it's a bad day. They call oh, yeah, how much did you lose today? How many billions? In a way, it doesn't matter because the only number that counts is our number on March 31st because that's the official audited number and that's what goes into our calculation uh, as far as what the investment return is. So pray for me on, on whatever your faith is. If you don't have a faith, get one on March 30th so that March 31st is, is a good day because, you know, we, we lost, you know, 26% uh, in 08 and 09, historic loss for us. We've been up, you know, the past two years strongly, and I mentioned 14.6% last year, uh, and we want to continue to be on the positive side. Because of the volatility, though, We've, we've had to take a strong look at what, what is our investment goal. And um, for a number of years, we've been at 8%, which is kind of the typical long-term assumed rate of return for public pension plans. Last year, we lowered it uh, to 7.5%. A, a number of other plans are, are 
considering lowering it. We're still more in the minority by being at 7.5%. And, you know, on the face of it, you may say, oh, from 8% to 7.5%, it's not such a big change. It's a big change, you know, for, for a public pension plan. And it had a cost impact in the year I was running for election, thank, thank you to my staff, of $400 million. It costs $400 million more, because when you lower your rate of return, it's going to cost you more money. Yeah, yeah. So we we review. We have a, we have an we have an actuary on staff. We review certainly every year our assumed rate of return. We we have a re, a requirement for a detailed review every five years, and that came up last year. Uh, you know, so in 2010, in 2011, we we've kept it at, at seven and a half percent. I think the city is still at eight percent. I know they've been considering lowering it. Uh, you know, again. You know, we're, we're, we're patient investors because we have a perpetual horizon. You know, we've, we've been around for 90 years. We're going to be around for forever. So, you know, we, you know the, the ups and the downs, while it causes uh, issues and digging out from the loss of 08 and 09 is still a challenge for us, uh, we do have a, a long-term horizon that enables us to be very patient. And as I mentioned, in response to your question, a lot of our money is in index funds. So, you know, index funds, there are lots of studies that argue whether active management versus passive makes more sense. We have a lot in indexes, and again, over the long term, it serves you well. But, but when you're going through the bumpy times, it's, it, it's a challenge. A couple of other points, I'll get to your, question, your other part of the question on investment. What we do, just to explain a little more about how it works for us, when we, when we factor in investment return into, our, uh, into the actuarial assumptions that go into the developing the rate, we use a five-year smoothing. So that terrible loss in 08 and 09, imagine if we had to absorb that in one year. You know, people think the rates are high now. If we had done that in one year, you can imagine what it would have done. That being said, we're still, we've got two more years to work through 08. That's why the pressure on the rates is still going to be upward. So it's a challenge for us, and a challenge for us to explain that, you know. So, so uh, assuming we don't go through what we went through, assuming what happened in 08 and 09 really was a once-in-a-lifetime experience, we hope it is, uh, you know, normalcy would suggest that the rates will start to come down in, in a couple of years. There are other pressures, people living longer, you know, and in terms of the dollar amount, you know, people retiring now at a higher salary, so you know, there are various other factors that go into it. In terms of investment strategy, again, we do a thorough and regular uh, assessment of our asset allocation, which is the key for us, and heavy emphasis on diversification. And because we're large, you know, large ships tend to move somewhat slowly when you're making adjustments. What we're trying to do now is reduce our exposure to public equities because of the volatility in the stock markets. Again, it's by degree. It's not like a huge shift. But we are um, uh, looking to do more in, in, in private equity, uh, particularly, where, again, that, that suffered as well in a way, no, no, but it's come back pretty well. Uh, we're, we're finally seeing positive returns on the real estate side again. Uh, that took a big hit during the downturn. And actually, over time, real estate has been our strongest performer, but it took such a dip in 08, 09, and that dip lingered. It's finally catching up. We continue to have confidence there. We've added um, two new buckets to be available to us. Not that we, w we have to do an investment there as part of our asset allocation, but because we're looking at new options, we wanted them available. One is real assets, so that would be for commodities, metals, timber, infrastructure. I'll get back to that. The other category is opportunistic, which basically is something that doesn't fit in all the other buckets, uh, so we, we need a place to put it. We've been very uh, cautious in making investments in the new categories, but we've, just, we've done a little bit in opportunistic. With regard to the current discussion on infrastructure, there's tremendous discussion about it. I get calls all the time about infrastructure from lots of people. Um, some of the pension plans, particularly the Canadians, have, have done a lot with that. We've not done it, and generally U.S. plans have not invested in infrastructure. There, there has been a, uh, an infrastructure uh, fund that's been set up in New York. My understanding is that that doesn't anticipate that the that New York Common will participate in that particular fund? Does not. Um, you know, so, you know, we'll continue to look at, at options in that area if we think they make sense, but um, 
as a fiduciary, you know, we have to look at what makes sense for the fund. We like a good uh, double bottom line when we can get it. And certainly the idea of, of, of you know, increasing employment through investment in infrastructure, and we need more investment in infrastructure in New York State. Whether that works for a pension fund that has a certain rate of return that it needs to achieve and certainly needs secure investments, uh, you know, re remains, you know, to be another question. So I would say just generally, we're looking at some of these new areas with a goal of reducing what has been a very heavy reliance on the public equity uh, markets because of all the volatility. Pension funds don't like volatility. Take a few more questions. I'm not, I'm we're not, not wearing you out. I, I have no other plans tonight, so. Well, <laughs> let me uh, let me ask you first. Uh, uh, let me next take a question from a new school student. Anybody? Anybody? Um, uh, if you don't have any, we'll move on to <laughs> new school student. Oh, <laughs> but but you'd want to be one. Yeah, you. <laughs> we can roll you right. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Long-term investment. You raised the question about uh, infrastructure, so I'd like to broaden that out in terms of climate change and the pension fund. In terms of risk, virtually all existing investments are threatened by climate change, which will have an adverse impact on the global economy as a whole. In New York State, the recent report based on a three-year scientific study pointed out how climate change will transform New York State's ecology and economy. We have already seen the effects of extreme weather, droughts, heat waves, torrential flooding, and storm surges, which will only increase in the future. Agriculture, commercial, and residential real estate, and urban infrastructures, especially those of coastal cities, are all at risk from climate change. So my question is, in terms of investment protection, to protect New York State and existing investments in the New York State Pension Fund, isn't it necessary to invest in renewable energy, which will mitigate climate change? At present, the Green Fund com comprises only $500 million, which is out of $146 billion, less than three-tenths of 1% of the total. How can we increase this Green Fund? Mm -hmm. Good question. Keep in mind, the, the, strategic, uh, the Green Strategic Investment Program was a new initiative and a new half a billion. You're starting to sound like me. It's only half a billion dollars. You know, it's, you know this is great. Um, that was a new initiative. It doesn't include all of our investments in clean technology and, and in uh, environmental. That was just a new allocation of money with a, with a target that was very, very specific. But in terms of, of, of clean technology, some of our in-state program, which is another billion dollars, goes to that, not all of it. Uh, and, and, you know, there are other investments that are in the category of, of sustainability that, you know, that, that I think would, would apply to what you're, you're pointing out. So we are always looking for more investment opportunities in, in that area. And I would actually like to see us do more in terms of alternate energy and clean technology here in New York State. You know, which is why with the in-state program, we, we did an investment not that long ago in the High Shelton Wind Farm in upstate New York. Uh, you know, we did a... Um, we did an investment in a, in a technology that was developed at Clarkson University in upstate New York and then was commercialized in, into a product. They're selling this product in Europe, uh, but there's a market for it and, and we're growing jobs here in New York and it involves uh, the green industries. I'd like New York to be a leader in this area. Uh, but this also is an area, you know, similar to the earlier question on, on, uh, on, on fracking, where we play a very proactive role, again, be, again because of our significant holdings in, in, through, through the public equities and, and those index funds. We, we are a leader in the, um, uh, in the investor network on, on, on climate change. Uh, recently, I was asked to serve on the board of Ceres, which, you know, as you know, is the uh, environmental advocacy group uh, as one of the investor representatives on the board. So we are very much involved with shareholder resolutions that, again, what is, what is the threshold? Risk. What are the risks to our investments by not assessing the impact of your, of your activities on, on, on climate change, on global warming? What will be the costs that will uh, follow if we don't pay attention to this issue and to this problem? We, we were involved last year in convening, uh, working along with Ceres, was it last year or two years ago, a group of, of investors on an international basis. We had Lord Nicholas Stern, uh, who was one of the leading experts on this issue, addressed the group to start to talk about how do we 
come up with a more comprehensive agenda. And in January, uh, in conjunction with the UN, being back in session again, working with Ceres, we're convening a group of, of institutional investors to focus on, on the question of how we move the corporations that we're invested in to deal with this issue. So we're, we're doing a lot. I'd like to see us put more money in this area. Wait a minute, you were just sitting there. Yeah, yeah. Well, but uh, I wasn't getting attention, so. <laughs> um, I think we referred earlier to um, a more widespread focus on uh, pension funds and best practices and the need for more coherent um, or uniform policies in that area. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that because New York has been a leader since Carl McCall was controller in corporate governance, uh, for one thing, um, and perhaps you might address more specifically how your office handles corporate governance. Um, the other issue, though, that I think it would be helpful for people if you could address is just how pension funds look at risk management and how they monitor risk, what yeah. kinds of risk and yeah. What's, yeah. what's the procedure. Um, well, we do a lot with corporate governance, and some of the questions touched on a couple, couple of the areas. And I want to give credit to Controller Ned Regan as well for, for his work in that area. Um, tomorrow, I'm giving a speech at Bloomberg on corporate governance and what we do for, you're not even listening, Joyce. <laughs> tomorrow, I'm giving a speech at Bloomberg on what we're doing on corporate governance. So I don't want to give that speech tonight, but we're doing a lot. And, and we've made an increasing priority because it is tied to you know, our investments, and, 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 and whether it's on government, governance issues in terms of corporate structure, environmental issues, some of which we talked about, uh, issues that, that, you know, could be, you know, from a societal perspective. We've been involved with an effort now in writing to uh, a number of companies we have holdings, and what is, what is your policy? Do you have a policy on non-discrimination with regard to sexual orientation and gender identity? Why? Because if you're not allowing opportunity for everyone in your organization, you're not going to be getting, you know, the, the best bang for our investment. Dollar. So we have a very aggressive program with regard to corporate governance, and we do see it very much as a part of, of, um, of how we protect our, our, our investment. In terms of risk, you know, certainly this, uh, this uh, roller coaster that we've been through uh, and digging out from under the loss in 08 and 09 points out that, that risk is, is going to be with us. And, and certainly at every level of our financial system, and I'm, I'm sure including pension funds, we didn't do a good enough job of assessing underlying risk. So I would hope, first of all, from a federal perspective, I know a lot of debates going on and, and uh, some in Congress are pushing it in the wrong direction, but I know others in Congress are pushing it in the correct direction. We, we need, we need uh, you know, the kind of regulatory oversight with the SEC and the other structures where risk is identified early and steps are taken to mitigate risk before it causes the kind of problems that we had in the past. What we've done in terms of our fund is we actually have created a position. We now have a director of risk. It's not a position that we had before. This is an example, I think, of a, of a, of a good practice that other, other plans have done as well. Uh, so, you know, our, our director of risk is involved in, in looking at all the asset uh, classes that we have and, and interacting with, having ongoing involvement with the, um, the decisions that are made by the investment officers all across our portfolio. Uh, so we have tried very hard, I think it's going to be a continuing challenge, uh, to do a better job of assessing risk in, in all of our transactions. Uh, I have a question, Tom. Um, Who are you? <laughs> I didn't see you, Tom. Uh, private equity. Um, the model for private equity historically has been that uh, jobs are destroyed, wages are dampened down, and benefits are demolished. What kind of screening mechanism would you put in place to somehow attempt to guard against that by private equity firms that you would retain to um, uh, manage some of those assets? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's an important question. We, you know, we're, we're pretty diligent in terms of, of looking at the track record of the firms that we work with. Um, We've actually probably had more issues on the public equity side than the private equity side in that regard. And, and, and when those issues are brought up, you know, we, uh, again, from the point of view of, of what is good for our investment, you know, we've not been shy about getting involved. You know, for instance, when, um, 
when there was the Mott strike, uh, you know, in upstate New York, you know, we, we wrote letters to the company saying, you know, the, the treatment of workers and, and stonewalling on labor negotiations, that is a reputational risk to the company and to our investment. And, and I'd like to think that what we did and others, you know, had an impact on it. So the same with private equity. If, um, if you know, and I can't think off the top of my head of any instance in, in recent times where we've had an issue like that, but I, I think with private equity, the smarter thing to do is, and I guess, I, I know there's a formal screen, but we certainly look very closely at the track record of the, of the company that we're, uh, the, the firm that we're investing in to see how they handle it. They know we're a public fund, so I think there's automatically a little more sensitivity to those kinds of issues. And if there is a problem, we're not shy about jumping in and saying, hey, you know what, um, we have a concern here. But it's, it, it's, it's been more of an issue with, on the public equity side, in my, in my experience there, than on the private equity side. Controller, could you elaborate a little more about if you could wave a wand and get all the types of law and rule changes to make it so that private citizens could join the public pension system, um, how do you envision that flow of additional revenue? What's the, both the benefit to the uh, contributor and to the system? And finally, is there a place to go on your website or elsewhere that would talk about this very topic? so that those of us in the public could uh, become more schooled in it. Well, you got the preview this evening, so it was better than the website. You got the live version. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you're raising the exact questions that, that y you, need, you need a more thoughtful analysis of. So I don't have the end game answer to you as, you know, uh, who would qualify to join it, how much would it cost them, how much, you know, what would be the fees involved, how big a staff would we need to manage you know, probably you'd need a parallel, you know, uh, team in terms of, of, of you know, of um, certainly administration side, the, you know, of it, uh, and maybe even you need, you need some more with investment. So, and one of the other questions would be, you know, do, do you just fold, fold everybody into the existing plan, Is it, or do you have some separation? These are all the questions that have to be worked out. But I think the threshold question is how, under federal law and IRS regulations, do you maintain your, your, your tax status now as, as, as a public pension plan? You can't jeopardize that. So that's why I think, you know, we all need to do more work on that question. But, you know, that's why I think we shouldn't be afraid to tackle it, because instead of people saying, well, you know, I don't have a, def I don't have a plan like that. Why should you have a plan like that? That's what the discussion, I mean, putting in basic terms. You know, we, we all go to you know, family gatherings, well, how come you have that? I don't have that. I wish I had that. Well, maybe we should start to say, all right, how can we, if, 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 if especially in a state like ours, where we're, we're in pretty good shape, is there actually an opportunity for us, you know, that would not only, you know, might actually help strengthen our plan, but more importantly, from a New York perspective of wanting to keep people in their homes and have, do all the other good things that I mentioned, uh, is, this, is this something that, that we could use as a jumping off point the strength of our plan and, and brought it out. But I don't have an answer to, you, to your question, Jeff, because that's exactly what we need to look at and come up with some answers. And, and I guess as I envision it, and also picking up on, on the question earlier, th there probably needs to be just some, some threshold direction, guidance, legal protections from the federal level, and then each state would make its own decision on, on how to structure it. So, uh, so no, I don't have anything on the website yet about it, but, uh, but your questions are right on target, and, and what we need, this more thorough analysis, discussion, listing of options to happen so we can answer those kinds of questions. We have it on our website. Okay, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Who's the most dangerous woman in America, right? In CEPO website, they have, they have, and as I said earlier, the, cent the center has been a real leader in advancing this idea. I'm not, obviously, uh, I'm not claiming uh, authorship of it. I want to lend voice to it, though, as someone who, perhaps, in addition to the the authority of this institution, you know, my lending weight to the idea will help advance it. Um, you mentioned the word attacked a few times, and I know that public pensions around the country have definitely been attacked in recent years following the financial crisis, but I'd love to know what, in your perspective, your fund is doing differently from an investment perspective 
an asset, asset allocation perspective or a philosophical perspective, what is the biggest thing that your fund is doing differently to differentiate yourself from your public fund peers? I think, well, we're, we're a little more conservative in, in, in a few areas. The actuarial assumptions that we use, we use, we use the aggregate cost method as opposed to entry age normal. It's a more conservative method, and, and other plans more typically use uh, the entry age normal. So I think that's one factor that, that has strengthened us. Uh, I think that, um, and using uh, Ned Regan as an example, in New York, despite some of the criticisms of it, the fact that we're structured with an elected official who's accountable for protecting the fund to the point Controller Regan had to go to court when, uh, when governors tried to do things with the fund that would dilute the strength of the fund. Y you know, his tenure, Carl McCall also, the case law has protected this office's role as being um, one that really looks out for the fiscal strength of the fund. You, most states do not have a governance model like this. I'm not arguing that other states should move to it, and not that we haven't had some problems in recent history you know, with this model, but if you're looking at it from a, a protecting of the funding of, of, of uh, the system, this model actually, you look at the long history, has been, been very protective. And what I mean by that is, is that, the, to me, the ultimate power of, 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 of um, how you keep a fund adequately maintained and funded is, this, is the setting of the contribution rate. Uh, and, and the ability of the controller, based on the actuarial recommendation, to set the rate and have that rate be in, enforced then, and in fact, the state and local government's paying it, you know, that really has, has kept, you know, the strength of, of, of this fund over, over a long period of time. So I, I think there's some different things about, about how we're structured and, 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 and also, I mentioned earlier, lowering the assumed rate of return. You know, most funds are still, you know, some are higher than 8%. You know, we've been more conservative in a whole host of ways that have contributed to uh, structural advantages that have, that have helped our funded status. Um, and certainly, you know, going into the meltdown, we were at, we were about 106, 107% in our funded status. So we were, we were in strong shape. Now we're below that now, obviously, because we had loss. But we went into this terrible time in, in the strongest shape of any state. So, and that's going to help, you know, help us as we, as we pull out of it. In terms of investment strategy, I mentioned in response to the earlier question some of the different things that we're doing. But I don't think, as I talk to my colleagues, we're doing anything dramatically different than other, other uh, certainly than other large plans. Uh, you know, again, there are always some, some differences, but you know, the, the, the general view is to be as, as well diversified as, as possible. New York, for a number of years now, prior to my being controller, has been, uh, it's not a big part of our allocation, but we have included absolute return strategies, hedge funds, as part of our diver diversification. Other funds, like, for instance, New York City, they're just starting to look at that. So we, we've done, you know, some things a little differently. Uh, but, you know, by and large, I think when, when you look at um, California or Texas or, you know, some of the bigger state funds, uh, you know, we're, it's similar in terms of how we handle our investment strategy. Come right down here. Uh, thank you, Controller, for your fascinating talk. I, I think it's, it's wonderful that you said you should not make policy uh, at the extremes. And so I guess my question is, <clears throat> Is the five percent, uh, the five year smoothing enough? Because I know that the, the, the annual contribution connects the budget to the pension. Right. And when elected officials are doing the budget, it becomes irresistible in the downturn, coupled with the constitutional provision to not call for a tier seven or a tier five or, or, or an abolition of a defined benefit plan. Yeah. On the upswing, it becomes irresistible to not grant the pension sweeteners. Yeah. And that's because they're yeah. seeing their, their annual contribution go down. Yeah. So is there something we can do to even, even stabilize more than the five-year smooth? And I guess my second question is, what do you do about the uniforms? What, I'm sorry. You have a <clears throat> the uniforms. The uniforms? The uniforms. The the uniform, the oh, I'm police, sorry. the fire, the... Yeah, the, I'm sorry. I didn't... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I thought it was... Do we have uniforms? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I avoided Catholic school, so now I suddenly I have to have uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my uniform, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's an interesting question. So, perhaps are you suggesting doing more than a five year smoothing? Or um, not lowering the contribution quite so much. Oh, I see. Well, uh, yeah, well, a couple of things. Well, some people have said do, do a longer smoothing. I mean, the problem with a longer smoothing is that it takes that much longer to work out, you know, a negative year. You know, so, and, and again, given that we don't know what's happening out there, you know, we may regret a decision like that. We actually did provide an opportunity for an amortization of part of the increase, which is another layer of smoothing that governments can opt into. Some have, many have not. Uh, but that's one way to give another, another layer of smoothing. As part of the, of the, um, the response to the meltdown, the last one, after uh, the dot-com bubble burst in 9-11, you know, we had two, you know, uh, one economic challenge and one, you know, real, real, real human ch challenge with the tragedy of 9-11. Uh, there were, and that's when we had a significant spike in rates back then as well. One of the changes was th there's, there was a minimum put in place now for contribution level. Uh, like four, four percent. See, before that, it, some localities were paying close to zero. Yeah, and see that was the problem, you know. So localities are paying almost nothing. Investment return is going to pay for all this. The sweeteners came in, and and we did we did the we did the enhancements, and then dot com bubble burst. Nine eleven happened, you know. All of a sudden, paying a lot more than they were paying before, and 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 the shock of the rates going up. So as as part of a way to um, to lessen that, there is a minimum now that you can't go below. Look, the reality is, it can be a lot of years before we're you know single-digit contribution rate. Um, you know, although, although for Tier 5, I mean, new employees are, I mean, it is, it is I forgot the exact, I think it's 8% 8, 8 for, new, for Tier 5? I'm looking at the top, ERS, around 8%. So over time, you, we will get there. It's still not going to be four, you know, in the 4% range. Um, you know, so I, I think I wouldn't change the five-year five, five year smoothing, but that amortization plan that we provided uh, is another way to do another level of smoothing. And it, it is an attempt, I don't want to get too technical, but it's an attempt to uh, allow for taking a portion of the increase, paying it out over, over time, and it would have the effect, if you opt into it, of, 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 of not eliminating the up and down, but, but putting it in a more narrow band. Because what we say to localities, if you opt into it, you can get the immediate benefit of, of being able to defer some of your pains, but you have to agree to establishing a reserve account so that when the, late, when the rates come down, you start to put money aside. So, so if you don't opt in, you'll, go, you'll follow what the, what the announced rate is. But if you do go in, you won't go down as fast. You won't go up as fast, you won't go down as fast. So the slope will be less. So that's exactly, that's an attempt to, to try to deal with that. You know, look, police and fire, uh, you know, the, the pensions are higher. It's a, it's a very different structure for lots of historic reasons. Um, you know, some of the localities that, you know, are concerned about, you know, the spike there, you know, we have to point out that some of them actually have opted into the most expensive plans with one year final, sal final average salary, not even three. You know, keep in mind, again, we're talking the state, the state plan, um, you know, the, the, the new tier change did affect the, the uniforms as well. So you have, you have people contributing now that, you know, Prior employees never contributed, so that you know, I think that was a significant change. Um, you know, my own personal opinion. Uh, you know, I know we, you know, we just had the news of a police officer, you know, getting killed today. I mean, it's a, it's different kind of work, and 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 I think we're always going to be paying a premium for people who, you know, choose to protect life and property. So, um, to the extent that one of the issues, particularly in uniformed, has to do with overtime you know, spiking pension costs. Again, some of that has been dealt with by the caps that are, that are in with tier five, but also, you know, when you look at the overtime question, you know, by and large, employees don't give themselves overtime. You know, so sometimes for local governments, they probably need to consider if they hired a couple more folks and control their overtime costs in the long run, you know, sometimes we get into this, this issue of headcount, you know. I'm controlling headcount. I have, you know, we did an audit on the Port Authority recently. We said, well, yeah, you're controlling headcount. Meanwhile, you're, you know, between overtime and consultants, you're paying all this other money. So I, I think part of it, 
you know, part of it may be looking at staffing, looking at how you, um, you know, how you identify those that, that, are, that are getting these higher uh, year-end salaries. You know, what, what's causing it? You know, is, is it a staffing question? Uh, you know, it, or you just don't have the management tools in place to see when someone gets an exorbitant amount of extra compensation, which ends up being then a lifetime, uh, you know, compensation to pension. You know, I, I think there are lots of things, and maybe we, you know, uh, maybe there are ways we, through the state system, can help localities, you know, identify uh, some of the outliers like that. But it, it's it's tough, especially with the uniform. It's tough because they're, you know, they are providing a service in a in a very difficult environment, and uh, you know, I've got my 9/11 pin, and we all. You know, we all have to keep in mind, you know, the work that's done is very different than, than a lot of the other work that's out there. And, and you know, the, the, there is a reason why they get a premium. Well, I want to stop us here and thank you very much uh, for being with us tonight. Thank you all for your interest. <laughs>